Hi everyone and welcome to a, another round of office hours. Uh, wonderful to see you here. Um, I'm Zoe from the Rebus community, uh, if we haven't run into each other before. And we're really excited today to have some guests sharing their stories of starting their open textbooks. Uh, this is a really great kind of bread and butter. We've all been there and a lot of us are, are looking at doing this sort of work in, in the future. So we're really excited to hear a lot of practical uh, experience and advice from folks who have been through this process already. Uh, and um, well, I'll hand over to Karen in a moment to uh, introduce uh, our guests today. And I uh, just wanted to take the chance to also encourage all of you to be asking your questions, think about any in advance you have, and also share your experiences with getting started with open textbooks. Um, there are so many ways to come at this work and, and all of you have uh, incredibly valuable insights and, and experiences to offer as well. So we'll have lots of time for discussion in the second part of the call. And for now, I will hand over to my lovely co-host, Karen, from OTN, uh, to introduce our guests today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Zoe. Uh, this is Karen Lauritsen. I'm with the Open Textbook Network, and we are delighted to partner on monthly office hours with the Rebus community. As Zoe said, this is a bread and butter topic. How do you get started? Um, and it's a really great question because there are a lot of different ways to get started, um, not necessarily one right way, and so you're going to hear a variety um, this afternoon and this morning. So in order to provide a little bit of context for two of our guests, I'm going to talk just a bit about the publishing cooperative at the Open Textbook Network, because both Karen Bjork and Kathy Labadorf, who are um, here as guests, are members of the publishing cooperative at the OTN. And so just to provide some context before I go ahead and introduce everyone, um, the OTN believes that higher education can own the production of academic contents. And so we have um, built a community of people who are doing just that, um, also through adoption workshops. And in the publishing cooperative specifically, we're focused on developing systems and support and sharing what we've learned. Um, it's platform agnostic. We're really trying to build capacity in publishing basics. Um, and we do that through professional development as well as through that community of support that people offer one another. So um, two years into the publishing cooperative, uh, we have a curriculum and I'll share the links with you um, when I'm finished with my blurb. Uh, but we have a curriculum um, that's been a great outcome. We've learned a lot together, Kathy and Karen, um, we're both founding members and things have changed a lot in those two years. Um, so the cooperative has always been free for our members, um, but now something that's changed is the pathway into the cooperative is called Pub 101. And that's a seven week orientation to publishing that's available to anyone in the OTN. Um, and it's really just an overview, an orientation to publishing, so um, that when you get to certain points in the publishing process, you know that there are resources for you out there and um, you're connected to colleagues who've been down that road before or who maybe are struggling in that moment uh, with something similar. So I'll also put links in the chat um, to our benefits table that shows some of the things available to you in the publishing cooperative. Also include a one sheet. And then as I mentioned, you'll hear from both Karen and Kathy who are members of the co-op. Um, David Reck is also here. He's the founder of Scribe. He partnered with us on getting the co-op off the ground. And one of the benefits of being in the co-op is that you can access their um, publishing professionals, editing, design, illustration. If there's something you don't have the capacity to do locally, but that you want to be able to offer your faculty authors, there's someone that you can turn to and just create one vendor relationship for those kind of professional services. So um, that's it for me. Zoe, I'll turn things back over to you in case you want to give context for some of your guests. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so a lot of what Karen said, I just say it here, here. The reason why uh, we work well together and why we love partnering with the OTN is that we share a lot of that uh, approach to, to publishing, to fostering capacity within uh, the OER community and really taking ownership of the publishing and creation process. Uh, so a few of the guests here today, Alice and Deb and Kathy, have all worked with Rebus community in different ways. Uh, and in particular, the work that we've done with uh, Deb and 
Allison. It um, has, was the foundation for what we're, uh, what a uh, program that we are launching or have just launched, uh, the textbook, textbook success program. I'm going to speak a little bit more about that towards the end of the session, uh, but it is a 12 month support program uh, for open textbook creation. We use that very broadly. It's, it's open all sorts of things um, that vaguely resemble textbooks. And uh, so it offers really direct uh, information about the publishing process, all in, you know, if you know Rebus community, we're about collaboration and community building within that. Um, so as I say, I'll speak a little more about that towards the end. Uh, and, and so again, just wanted to, to um, share the, the context there as well of the work that we've done with some of our guests today. And I'll add, it's not an either or situation. You could certainly use Rebus projects in the OTN to organize what you're doing. Um, and we're always looking for ways to partner and complement what we're doing in our communities. So um, we have many guests today. And if you're new to office hours, they're going to speak very briefly to give an overview of their experience related to starting an open textbook project. Then we'd like to turn things over to you so that you can direct the conversation with your questions and inquiries. So first we're gonna hear from Karen Bjork. She's head of digital initiatives at Portland State University Library. And then we'll hear from Katie Kiro Kosian, who's adjunct lecturer at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Following Katie, we'll hear from Kathy Labadorf, former open educational resources and social sciences librarian at the University of Connecticut. Former because Kathy retired recently. Um, then we'll go on and hear from Allison Brown. She's the Digital Publishing Services Manager at SUNY Geneseo. And Deb Amory, who's Professor and Chair of the Department of Social Science and Public Affairs at SUNY Empire State College. So I will now begin by turning things over to Karen. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've been asked to speak about is really looking at once a manuscript is done and created, sort of how do we make the decisions on what type of copy editing, um, design layout, sort of production piece of it. So I wanted to uh, just briefly give a background about the textbook that we decided to work with and sort of some choices that we've made. Um, so the textbook that I'm specifically talking about is a philosophy textbook. Um, it is currently available on our PDX Open site. It's called Inferring and Explaining. And it was created uh, specifically for Philosophy 201, an introduction to philosophy, as well as Philosophy uh, 320, which is a critical thinking. The, the book took about a year and a half for the author to create, and during that time, I did work with him to do check-ins, to make sure about his progress, to answer any questions. So I was very much involved from the very beginning of the manuscript creation all the way to the actual um, publishing of the manuscript. So the author's goal for his book is he really wanted to save students money. That was the main thing that was driving him, but he also wanted to create a useful tool to increase students' understanding um, of evidence-based arguments in everyday context in regards to philosophy. Um, and the, the, author, the author also wanted the book to be fun. Like one of the things that he really found was a lot of the books that he was teaching with were really dull and boring and didn't have day-to-day -day real life sort of context. So he wanted to be able to incorporate that and add that into his open access textbook. Um, in regards to what were the goals for the project, so as I, um, so for my goal, as the project manager, I really wanted to sort of have an experience of taking a book from the very beginning to all the way to the end of the production. And that also included being very much involved in the design and the copy editing. So up until the point that we joined the OTN, um, the publishing cooperative, my we were not handling any of the copy editing, any of the layout or the design. I was relying on the authors to actually go and find copy editors and designers, and we were contracting that out. And we were running into a lot of um, issues with this, and we were finding that there were a lot of inconsistencies. And so our manuscripts were running into a lot of bumps um, along the way that just wasn't really helping uh, with sort of the author's experience as well as our own. And we were, you know, coming away, walking away from it going, is this really what we want to do? 
Um, so once the manuscript was completed, I had to then spend some time to figure out like, what do we want done with the manuscript? How are we gonna move forward? What would we like scribe to take care of? Um, were there any things that, anything that we could do? Um, so from the author's perspective, he um, had already had his manuscript go through some level of peer, peer review. So he had sent out his manuscript to uh, colleagues at other universities to kind of get their opinions on the structure what was the pedagogy? What would it be something that they would teach with in their own course? What adjustments would they want to see or, or be made? But he never really sent it out to anyone for any type of copy editing or proofreading. I mean, they had sent sort of small comments, but it wasn't anything major. And the author knew that uh, he had a tendency of having run on <laughs> sentences, um, but he also wanted to make sure that his voice was consistent throughout the manuscript. He had been writing this manuscript for years so his style sort of had changed he had cobbled together a lot of uh, you know notes and lectures and so he really wanted to make sure he had that consistency and that was something that some of his peer reviewers had actually brought up as well um, so from you know so that was the one big piece the other big piece was really the structure piece so he had a lot of features that he wanted to be able to incorporate in his manuscript and it was really important that the structure was done correctly so that the logic of the book made sense and we really focused on making sure that we could um, you know talk to the author to see like okay what is your vision how do we make this work um, and then how do we utilize sort of you know the the layout and design of a book of that of somebody who you know has that professional background to really enhance it to make sure that the building of the logic is seen throughout each chapter that all of the the exercises at the end of every chapter the quizzes really made sense that the students had an understanding of okay this is where i'm going to land you know and what was going on in chapter one was going to happen as well in chapter 12 that, that was going to happen in chapter 13 you know so students could really follow along and make sure that they had that sense and that was really really important to us we did want to make sure that you know we were really clear and that we were presenting the book in in the way that was the vision of the author. Um, so in regards to support and consultation that we received from the co-op community and scribed, you know, so as I mentioned earlier, we have been supporting open access textbook authors um, publishing works for years, but we had never gotten into sort of that piece of being able to, to offer the design. So for us, it was really a learning opportunity. We, uh, I mean, I was constantly asking co-op questions. I was leaning on everyone to be like, okay, how do we do this? How do we we have this conversation with the author about that you know where do we even get started but I also saw it as a really useful way to train my staff to get my staff much more involved in the production piece we use Jeff's book as sort of a template for okay if we were going to do this across multiple people and make this into something we're going to incorporate into our um, general program how do we do this? How do we take this on? So we really made this into this learning opportunity, be able to provide my staff with a new level of skill set, as well as then, you know, advertise it and add it as, hey, look, this is what we're offering. Uh, you know, faculty authors will now have a manuscript that will look, you know, professional, that will make sense, that will be, you know, have a similar voice, and everything will be packaged up all great and neat and pretty um, at the end. So we received a lot of support from the co-op as well as from Scribe throughout this project and really would not be able to complete it and do it had it not been from all of the support that we got. Um, so I'm going to kind of just leave it at that. Um, and uh, if you have questions, um, yeah, we'll let everyone know. Thanks, Karen. Um, it's great to hear that you learned a lot because I know also that a lot of people learned from you because you did co come into the co-op with um, such expertise and experience already in, in publishing open textbooks. So next we are going to hear from Katie. Katie. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so the book that um, we are working on is a textbook, an introductory textbook on North American archaeology. Um, there are 16 chapters and it spans um, over 12,000 years of archaeological history um, and also covers all of North America. 
one of the main issues in early conversations that I saw um, was that um, many North American archaeology textbooks um, really just focus on the U.S. or a little bit U.S. centric. Um, so a lot of um, Canadian archaeologists reached out to me saying they were interested in this because they felt as though few sites north of the U.S. Um, Canadian border were ever included um, and definitely also south um, of the U.S. Mexican border. So um, that was an issue that we hope to tackle head on. There's um, subject matter expert teams for each of the 16 chapters. So I'll talk about that when I get to challenges, um, but herding 16 groups of cats um, has um, taken a bit of practice and there's, there's kind of that um, element of it. So it's not just working one-on-one -on -one with a particular subject matter expert. You can imagine very few archeologists have the background where they would be able to write a textbook of this nature, you know, that covers millions of square miles of territory. So there are about 60 to 75 archeologists involved, again, from the US and Canada mainly. It's about a 50-50 split, believe it or not, which is quite unique um, and it's very intergenerational. There are lots of grad students um, at various points along the way and junior scholars and then um, folks that are uh, tenure track or tenured and also uh, you know retired archaeologists who now have the chance to write something that they really hadn't had the chance to do um, when they were working full-time professionally. So um, that's some exciting elements about the project. Um, in terms of support, we did get an early um, support grant through UMass Amherst, where again, I'm adjunct faculty. Um, that kind of supported my time, like planting the seed and seeing it grow um, during the summer of 2017. So this project has been kind of officially kicked off for just under two years when we really got a first team together and started meeting formally. Um, it's, been, it's been roughly two years. Uh, we found Rebus just through me engaging with um, different communities that were involved in open access. Um, and that's how I found Rebus and they were able to support and just have those, maybe not in person, but face-to-face -face, um, nonetheless meetings to get me to think through some of the process here. Um, I like to joke that this, pro this project started with a tweet, um, which it did in the summer of 2017. I, I just I had received the funding, but I didn't know how, how does one begin this if you know you need to recruit a team. So I just tweeted out, you know, who would be interested in an open textbook, um, you know, hashtag everything that I could think of. And I think like 12 people liked it. And then I found out who those 12 people were and I emailed them directly. Um, so I used a little bit of my stalking skills. Um, and from there, some of those people are still involved in the project. Um, some gave me great leads for other folks that might be involved, but I just had to start somewhere. And the biggest platform I thought I had was my, my Twitter account. So that was um, where that seed really started. We do have a steering committee, but I will say that that's probably one place where I could better have utilized my efforts. Um, I haven't leaned on our steering committee much yet. Um, it's really been working one-on-one -on -one or in those smaller groups, trying to get those smaller groups to get their chapters finished and then bringing those chapters together um, and getting us to a place where we have a small collection of chapters that I can start sending out for review. Um, but as of now, I'd say we have about 40 to 50 percent of the textbook um, drafted and um, we're hoping to have, you know, another 10% kind of every quarter is how we're going for the last bits. The, again, I talked about herding cats. So an issue has been every team is on their own timeline or place in the timeline. And it's just moving every team forward in whatever way that I can is how I've helped. Um, but there are some teams that are 100% finished with their drafts and they're ready for review. And there are some teams that haven't even really coalesced yet or have maybe gotten together and written the outline and a group of them got together a few times to agree on elements that should be in their chapter um, but then nothing's actually been on the page so i've been trying to um, batch out the textbook in like three groups of like these are the ones that are almost done almost ready to go out of the nest and these are the next ones up and once my efforts are you know in a good place with those other groups i'll kind of shift focus um, so that has been a challenge. 
one thing I think if someone's interested in doing something like this to mention is that um, a few things have worked and have worked well. Um, we have a monthly meeting of anyone and everyone who wants to attend. It's the second Friday of every month. And there was much discussion about, you know, the first Friday, there's deadlines, the last Friday, and, and the second Friday, it's like a quiet time. So we um, have a meeting every second Friday for about 14 months now. Sometimes there's, you know, I never know who's gonna come, but whoever comes, we have a plan of attack, or if it's um, related to a particular chapter, that's what we'll focus on. Um, so I'm just kind of letting them tell me how I can help, and whoever attends the office office hours is kind of what it, what it ends up feeling like. Um, we make uh, great progress. And then we've been sharing out at those meetings as well. Another thing that's been really helpful is, um, just utilizing Google as best as I can and having everything there. So there's not all these like drafts and who knows where the drafts are. Um, Dropbox frightens me a little bit for this number of people. So um, just really trying to carefully use Google and say, if it's not in Google, it doesn't exist. And then also when we get to a certain point, we've been stitching together the different, um, cause every section has its own Google doc. So if you say you're going to write the, X section, you get your own blank Google Doc, and this is where you're going to write it so it doesn't get very large and busy. Um, and then when the team says they're getting close to ready, or they need like, they're just hit a wall, they need some inspiration, I take it upon myself to become a seamstress, and I stitch together all the sections, and then I share with them, like, well, here's where you are, look, you know, you've done half of your chapter, really, um, and we kind of stitch it together and then create a new document of everything together that we can start um, reading through. Um, so that's been a place that we've gotten to having um, for each chapter has a team lead or a chapter team lead. That's been really helpful because then I can just send 16 emails right to one person for each chapter and then say, Hey, what's going on with your kind of team? And they're able to give me a sense of the pulse um, for their team. So something like that is definitely what I would suggest like middle managers almost um, where you can get a sense of the pulse. And then I think those were some of the main things other than just reflecting on if I were to do this again. Um, obviously, I think more support for my time would be helpful. Um, I haven't really seen too many grants that were um, available other than the small seed grant that I received, which was helpful. But it's difficult for me to um, put in the amount of time that's needed to um, keep track and to keep up on everything um, when I also have um, a, a long list of paid contracts that I'm working on as well. So that's been a challenge, but also just having some good people around me to keep me honest um, and to get that kind of back and forth has been inspiring. And uh, I think I've only, I, of all the authors of the 60 to 75, I only knew about two or three, two or three have I even ever met. So it's this huge community around this book of people that I've never actually um, met, but at the annual meeting, we often come face to face. So, uh, and then try to have a little meet and greet there. And another challenge is for archeology, span the summer is not a good time to write. The summer is a good time to dig. <laughs> so it's, you know, they're in the field. It's hard for me to, when's a good time to write? I think the winter um, is the good time. So sometimes there's a lot of silence when I'm ready, because um, I'm not in the field as much anymore. Um, so that's been a unique challenge, I think, to my discipline. Thank Otherwise, you. that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katie, so much. Um, I appreciate um, stocking skills and being a seamstress and how both of those things are really helpful to project management. And just hearing about, um, as a lead author and, and project manager on a project with so many people involved is great. Um, I'm now going to turn things over to Kathy. Hi, this is Kathy Labadorf, and as Karen said, I am the former OER librarian. This is because I retired on August 1st, and I am 66, so it's okay. I didn't get out. Um, so uh, I am into my third career now. But um, the Yukon story is, uh, is quite different from the first two we've heard, and, and as Karen, both Karens mentioned, um, in the OTN and the Scribe um, project, we learn so much because there's such a variety of 
levels of expertise. And uh, I, I can tell you several things that I've learned from Karen Bjork um, already, and I thank her for that. She doesn't know what they are, but I'll someday I'll tell her. Um, but, but when I, I was approached in uh, 2015 to start up an OER program at UConn, and my, my supervisor said, this is the kind of thing you're interested in, right? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so I did, but I had never published. I hadn't even, um, you know, written an article for a journal and had it published. You know, I hadn't really had nothing. I was a musician. I was uh, other, other things besides being a librarian. Um, but I said, sure, I'll do that. So we started that um, and uh, did, did quite well. And uh, with, with, working both with OpenStax and then becoming part of the OTN and then having um, a grant offered by our provost for people who wanted to either redesign their courses or write a textbook. And there were, there was interest on our campus from a couple faculty, three faculty who wanted to write a textbook. So I'm going to be talking about two of those. Um, one was, and these started in 2016, um, physical chemistry which is a, a 3000 level upper grad course. The, fac the faculty member is a, an award winner, a, an amazing publisher. He's been teaching at UConn for over 30 years. And um, he is Indian. And when he was in India, he didn't have enough money to buy textbooks when he was in college. So he already knew the situation when a student wants to learn, but they can't get a textbook. So he wanted to create textbooks to share his knowledge with people uh, wherever they are, whatever they would like to do. So this was physical chemistry. It's a 3000 level course and it's an upper level undergrad. So it's not a basic intro level. It's more for majors. The book itself, um, turned out to be over 400 pages in Word manuscript and had 23 chapters. Um, it has lots and lots of special features, as you can imagine, with lots of formulas, um, incredibly from simple to very intense and um, uh, images, um, complex images. Uh, he also created active learning exercises. He did self quizzes at the end of every chapter with 20 questions in each one and put the answers, he wanted the answers right at the end of the question. So the students would know they didn't have to search for it. There's the answer and then hopefully they would want to figure out why they didn't get it right. What did I get wrong here? So he wrote it natively. He's a Mac person. And I, I don't know about anybody else, but Macs are the bane of my existence. Uh, but he wrote it on a Mac and uh, it initially started as PowerPoint presentations for his course. Uh, when this was before the book came up and that's where he did basic images and the PowerPoint. So the images themselves were in JPEG or, you know, PowerPoint likes EMF if it does that. Um, so we, we really started with a very, uh, very basic manuscript uh, to, to work with. The second course, uh, the second book that came by was a probability course. This one's quite interesting in that almost the entire department joined together to create this probability course. And it is, it was based on um, the work, the teaching, the, the teaching tools of a former director of that, um, that department. And They've taken that work because it was so good. I guess probability doesn't change all that much over time and they can, they, you know, they keep, they can upgrade some of the language and so forth. But uh, all the, all the faculty came together and they created this textbook that they've been using with students for like three years now. So the students have been the peer reviewers and that course has gone from like 200 students a semester to over 300 students a semester and it keeps on growing and growing and the students love the textbook. We haven't been able to publish it yet. It's written in uh, LaTeX. Um, it has formulas. It's only 100 pages long. So this is, I mean, this is the book I would have loved to have at first, not the 400 page book with all those everything else. Uh, so so this book itself, I think, doesn't need any peer review. It's had student review, and the students are saying yes to this book. They're saying it's marvelous. The other thing that is in this book is uh, UConn has quite a bit of educational technology uh, available for faculty. 
And so a lot of the probability, a lot of mathematics and science folks love to use the light board. I don't know if any of you know what the light board technology is, but math professors especially love it because they're facing the people while they're writing on the on the light, light the light board their their numerical their formulas rather than you know the mathematics professor was always the one who was facing the board and didn't see the students while they were writing but so this is one where they're actually you actually see the face of the professor as well i see this and all of those will be open and they're up on a repository and they will be linkable into this probability book so that that's pretty cool. I know LaTeX is, um, is great for Re a Rebus project. I think they they can go right over, but in it will also be great in Scribe because that's where that's where it's going to go through um, as well as well as these links. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the physical chemistry book because that's what I've done most of my work on. Now, when we first started the uh, the co oh, the co-op, the OTN co-op, uh, I didn't want me to be the only person learning about publishing. So I gathered in a couple of my colleagues from UConn, one from the Hartford campus, one from the Waterbury campus. The Waterbury campus person had a background in editing. She had been an editor for journals, so she knew that little piece of, of publishing. The other person from Hartford had had a lot of experience in a graphic design, so she knew Adobe products. So I, I kind of got them into, into together. So the three of us went through this co-op pro pro program together. Uh, not only did I have the amazing expertise of that first group um, in the OTN, but then my whatever I didn't get, because I didn't have backgrounds in either of those, I could ask my colleagues and we would have meetings and talk about it. So the the, the fact of, like Karen did, Karen went through it and then she spread it to her staff. I had, We were just really learning it from the ground up. And so we just had to start from where we were. So um, we went to the trainings and uh, Dr. Kumar had originally thought of his physical chemistry books as a set of three volumes. Of course, he's done one, that's 430 pages. Um, but he would like to do the other two, which are, um, you know, which will take the student all the way through to what he feels is the conclusion of where you want to get to with physical chemistry. Um, I, he is having the same time, that, same problem that Katie has in that he was given money to do the book, but he wasn't given time to do the book. And uh, if any of you have any say in what kind of um, reward a faculty member would get for doing an open textbook, if you can get your campus to give them time, that seems to be the real crux. Um, very, very important. So uh, that, and that actually did happen with our probability professor, Alexander. He, um, he just assumed he would get time. When he spoke to his director, the director said, you want time? And so somehow the director made it happen and gave Alexander time to begin putting all this and assembling this together. And obviously you can see that it was well worth it because of the outcome of that book. So on um, uh, another one of, uh, before I fi finish, the, there's one other thing that VJ, who VJ is Dr. Kumar, who is a physical chemistry, he wants talking about the, in the repository, the book itself, that he wanted um, the entire book to be separately downloaded by chapter. If you wanted a one, only one chapter, you can have that. But, and I think this has to do with how he's more into journals. You know, when you go into a, a volume of journals, you can get each one you want. But what he has asked for is that at the beginning of the book, the main, the main table of contents, but at the beginning of every chapter, he wants Scribe to do an expanded table of contents so people can go right down to the very minuscule level of that, uh, of each chapter. And so students can download the whole book or they can download just one chapter if that's what they need. And it also has the, the guide to get them where they're going. So, Kathy, oh, I'm, yep. sorry. I'm gonna interrupt you. Five just minutes already? I know it goes really fast. It, it goes really fast, and I'm I am always uh, it's always tough to interrupt. But I am going to interrupt you just because we're running out of time, and I want to be sure okay. that we from Allison and Deb. Um, sure. But thank you, for, thank you for sharing some of the complexity. Hearing your stories really illustrates 
sort of what different subjects and different authors are looking for and sort of how we all try to find ways to accommodate them. So thank you. I will now turn things over to Allison and Deb. Great. Um, thanks. I'm Deb Amory. I'm a professor at SUNY Empire State College um, in anthropology. Actually, uh, my training is in anthropology, not archaeology, but anthropology. Um, I'll just start off, and Allison and I are going to play team tag this, I think, throughout. Um, the subject of the textbook we were working on is introduction to LGBTQ studies. Um, and actually, there were two other existing texts that we looked at from UMass Amherst and from Portland State University um, that, that were very helpful in thinking of conceptualizing the project. Um, the goal is to address contemporary LGBTQ social issues um, from the perspective of the social sciences. So from sociology, anthropology, political science, psychology. A lot of the textbooks tend to focus in this area on the humanities, sort of art, literature, so we, we want to be sure to sort of balance that. We also do that. Um, and our motivations and values statement from the project summary template that we had from Rebus, which is very helpful, included developing accessible introduction to a wide range of the field of LGBTQ studies, um, serving both the curious public and non-traditional students. Empire State College serves non-traditional students. So we're hoping actually for a global audience, which is, something we may or may not achieve with this draft, but we're going. We also want to employ an interdisciplinary approach informed by the social sciences, but also by a feminist intersectional analysis. And that was sort of core to our recruitment of authors um, and to embrace multiple learning styles. So we're also in different iterations trying to add multimedia components to the textbook. Um, Allison, why don't you, do you want to talk about the team? Yeah. Um, so I'm Allison Brown at SUNY Geneseo. Um, so at SUNY, um, we're a little unique because we do have a central, um, a central organization support system for OER called SUNY OER Services. So I serve with them as the support for um, OER creation projects. Um, so that was how, um, part, partly how Deb and I got connected up. Um, she had come um, to us with, you know, an idea for a great project and we wanted to jump on board. Um, so, um, so Deb is the main author and she recruited a co-author at Binghamton, another state university of New York school, um, Sean Massey. Um, and then through our, um, we did a lot of calls for proposals, calls for contributors through the Rebus community, through all of our other OER channels, through some different disciplinary channels. Um, so we ended up with a great team of people. And one thing that came out of that was that we had noticed a lot of librarians wanted to help. Um, and one, so we had all these librarians and we had one librarian that was um, very keen on um, helping us and kind of, you know, making a librarian specific um, part of the project. Um, so she is our librarian lead. So that's Rachel Wexelbaum of St. Cloud. Um, so through all of those calls for proposals, we have a team of authors, um, research profile authors, reviewers, and then librarians mostly who are authoring the mediographies. Um, and they all together represent 43 different institutions. Um, and within that, five different um, State University of New York institutions, three City University of New York institutions, and three countries. I'll pass it back over to Deb. Yes, it, thanks. It is quite the crew, and it reminds me of, of Katie's juggling act. We didn't use tweet. I used email. The old, we used the old-fashioned way. Um, I was very lucky. Um, to have the support of both my institution and the SUNY State University of New York system, um, including where Al Allison, um, I started out learning about OERs by adopting them in Introduction to Anthropology and um, a related course, and then went on to, to propose developing this textbook, which was great. Um, so I got some support from the system initially for adoption and then um, actually proposed to the point of it takes time. I did a sabbatical proposal for a six month sabbatical. So I was able to get that 
um, to support the work and then applied for funding through the State University of New York additionally in this SUNY OER services, again, where Allison works. Um, so I, I feel very lucky to have both financial and time, um, but it wasn't enough, trust me. <laughs> it's like 40, you know, we incredibly $40,000, six months. Um, but I think traditional publishers spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a textbook and it does take years. Um, so we're learning, you know, we've, we're very lucky, but we're continuing to look for more funding. Um, our latest idea is to pursue digital humanities funding to develop the, um, the multimedia wraparounds to the textbook. So, and Alice? Yeah, and then from the support side, so we were looking for kind of interdisciplinary and um, collaborative projects like this, um, both to invest in when we, you know, when we had a call for proposals for OER creation, um, and then also to target areas that didn't have a lot of OER. Um, so we, that's one of the reasons why we were really excited about Deb's project. Um, and I was also really excited because we had started, we had consulted with Deb early on in the process. And I think um, she was just applying for the sabbatical and Rebus was doing their beta for projects. And I had been following Rebus and looking and trying to see how I could get involved for a little while. So when I saw that there was a, an application to be part of the Rebus projects, and then Deb's project came along, I was like, ooh, let's apply. Um, so we were lucky enough to kind of get looped into there um, so that I could kind of get to know the Rebus community better um, and to learn how to better explore that and see how Rebus and SUNY could, um, could work together. Oh, you're that, muted. Uh, I noticed that we're running out of time, so <laughs> I thought I'd skip right to for reflections. Um, one of one of the things that I thought worked really well, um, we used the money to bring the authors together for a weekend, a face-to-face -face sort of um, workshop where we learned about OERs, we learned about writing learning outcomes, we talked about the structure and the learning goals for the textbook and get everybody hopefully more on the same page, get develop some personal relationships that we didn't have before. Um, and I thought that was, it was helpful in a lot of ways. Um, uh, maintaining those relationships over time is gonna, is gonna be the challenge, but there's ways to do that. Um, and Allison, you wanna talk? Yeah, yeah, I would just say that because this was, this project started in one way and has kind of grown and changed um, with more people and different people getting involved. I think that's been one of the exciting things to watch. Um, and then, but it can also be the flip side. So it, you know, the book grew um, like chapter wise in a way, um, which is very exciting. But then when we get down to the nitty gritties, I think was it um, Katie had mentioned hurting hurting kittens. Um, so now that we're at the peer review point and all of our chapters are at different stages, um, that's just been an organizational challenge. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, one of the things that I have really enjoyed was being able to put out a call and get, um, get in touch with, you know, new people and new scholars and kind of let, let the community inform how this book is growing. So that's been really exciting. All right. Thank you, Allison and Deb. It's really fun to hear about your project back and forth from your two perspectives and, and um, how you guys work together and what you um, discovered from all of our guests who I would like to thank. Um, I kept hearing you know, the words about teams and finding support and working together to um, learn how to do this thing. So um, we have 13 minutes for questions. So uh, please feel free to put your question in the chat or unmute and ask, ask our guests um, what you would like to know. It's, um, we heard very interesting case studies. They're all sort of distinct and they have their own um, uh, list of, of challenges or what's the word I want, like prerequisites, like what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to do. And so there's a lot here to um, learn from. Unfortunately, Katie had to step away. So she's um, not able to directly answer your questions, but 
uh, Aperba put her email address there in the chat if you would like to reach out to her and learn more about something that you heard uh, today. All right, AJ asks, how do you suggest convincing department chairs and administrators to give professors time to develop OERs? And Carolyn seconds that question. The only experience I've, successful experience we've seen at Geneseo was offering the money that the department would need in order to, um, in order to be able to give the professor that time off. And basically the way that it works in ours is that they, they need the money that they would need to pay either an adjunct or another faculty member for taking overload. Um, so usually it's a money question. Um, so it's not. You know, just speaking also as a former college administrator that, that if you convince, if, if administrators see the savings that are produced by OER work, whether it's adoption or creation, like the course that went from 200 to 300 and continues to grow, that's a stream of revenue that you could tap into and take 10% of it to fund the further creation of OER stuff. So I, I, I haven't seen anyone doing this kind of creative bookkeeping to support the generation of, but it is, it's a money issue that, um, in New York State, we have legislative money coming down for OER support, and that's been critical, I think, to what's going on here. Um, but it's, it's a real problem. We'll be talking about some of those money issues in the October office hours. Um, so thank you, Deb and Allison, for sharing. I also encourage any of you um, in the audience or in the call, um, in addition to our guests, if you have experience or tips or thoughts to offer, please feel free to chime in um, and we can have a conversation. For example, Marilyn said um, offering promotion and tenure credit is also helpful um, in addition to money. Rachel asks, what are good places to look for funding to develop OER? I always re recommend starting with your librarian. A lot of libraries actually have OER uh, grants that they offer, um, or you can go and look across campus. So our Office of Academic Innovation also offers grants and then look statewide. So in Oregon in particular, we have statewide grants. I know that in New York they do, and I believe that other states, it looks like Kansas State also, um, you know, has, has some, uh, or like, yeah. So each, I think states as well are now starting to offer grants, um, Virginia. So it's, it, it's sort of like start on your campus and then start to actually grow out or look wider and even ask those people on campus what they would know. Again, with the librarians, says Kim. <laughs> it's a great response. What other questions do you have for our guests or for one another? If any of you are trying to launch your own open textbook project and are wondering how to get started, um, or perhaps you're further on in the process and you're seeing um, some things that uh, you're looking for help with, Karen talked about editorial services, for example. Carolyn is looking for information about working with campus bookstores. We have had that as a topic in the past um, on Office Hours, Carolyn, so um, we, could, we could send you that video because um, we do record the sessions. And then is there anything uh, anyone else would like to chime in about working for bookstores in the chat? Feel, please feel free. This is what often happens in Office Hours, right? All of these things link together, they work together. You think of one thing and you're like, how did I get here? And then you think of another thing. And so um, feel free to, to ask all the questions you have. Maybe Lee or Perva can track down that, that video for you, Carolyn. Well, if the silence is sustained, 
and the thank yous are starting in the chat, that may mean that we are wrapping up. Zoe? Thanks, Karen. Uh, so as we're wrapping up, I did just want to uh, talk a little bit more about our textbook success program, which we've recently launched. This has come from the, the beta that Alison referred to that Deb and Alison were both a part of. We're working closely to support um, these kinds of projects. And so the program is a 12 month support offering. It starts with 12 weeks of courses on publishing start to finish. So right from scoping your project through uh, content creation, through promoting your project, building and managing teams, editing peer review, then preparing for release and getting the content out in the world. So it's right. The, the whole start to finish um, and within that a lot of room for navigating what is relevant to, to the projects who, who are part of the cohort who go through this process together. Um, we are starting with our first cohort in October which we're very excited about and you'll soon see uh, all of that activity happening on our platform and we wanted to let you know that our next cohort will be starting in February. So if you're interested, you think this program might be a fit for you, we would love to hear from you. I'll get uh, Leah or Perva to drop a link into the chat so you can get in touch. And so you know, uh, we also have a bit of an early bird special. Um, so if you uh, commit to a project or, or a number of projects from your institutions before November 15th, you'll get a bit of a, a, an a early bird price on that. Um, so we're all lined up for, for February and we're really, really looking forward to, to getting this going. It has taken, you know, it's taking all of the learning and the experience that we have with, with the projects we've worked with, Katie's included, you know, she's done a really incredible job picking up, uh, you know, the resources that, that we've um, developed and, and running with them. Uh, so it's all based on that work and we're now pleased to be able to share it with a much wider group. So we hope to hear from some of you very soon. And with that, I think we can say our, our big, big thank yous to our guests today. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and adventures. Um, There's always so much to learn from uh, all the many ways that people approach this work. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you, Karen, everybody who's here attending. Really lovely to see you all and hear from you. And we will see you again next, next month. As Karen said, we're talking money, money, money. <laughs> to find it, what to do with it, all the good stuff. <laughs> How to count it. <laughs> I, I don't know why I said that. Okay, everybody. Uh, Karen, Katie, Kathy, Allison, Deb, and all of you, thanks for joining us and see you next time. Thanks, everyone.